The Gospel reading for this second Sunday of Advent is from the very first verses of the Gospel according to Mark, and it plunges the reader right into the preaching ministry of John the Baptist. Mark ignores the stories of the circumstances surrounding both John's and Jesus' birth. From the outset in his Gospel, both are grown men. John has already embarked on his preaching of repentance and baptism, and he's just on the point of introducing his cousin Jesus to the world as the Messiah long ago foretold by the prophet Isaiah. As my old classics professor would have said, John arrives on the scene like Athena, sprung fully armed from the head of Zeus. Here are Mark's words, chapter 1, verses 1 through 8. The beginning of the good news about Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet. I will send my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way. A voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. And so John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. The whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him. Confessing their sins, they were baptized by him in the Jordan River. John wore clothing made of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. And this was his message. After me comes the one more powerful than I, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. I'd like to go back in time a little to what we might call John's spiritual formation. And while I do that, you can be looking at Leonardo da Vinci's painting of John the Baptist. For years and years, John had lived in the wilderness. He didn't start out preaching and baptizing. I'm sure most of his time was spent trying to survive on locusts and wild honey. God was his only companion during those years, and we can only imagine how much time he must have spent in solitude and prayer, slowly being made aware of what his future ministry might be. This time of preparation did not include lessons in elocution or public speaking or the proper technique for conducting a baptism. So what kinds of lessons was he learning? How was he being spiritually prepared for his future role? Well, I think first and foremost, the lesson John had to learn was one of radical humility. His job would involve never drawing attention to himself. His job was to become merely a voice crying in the wilderness proclaiming the greatness of another. Now, I'm not sure how you learn that. And in our culture that prizes the individual and personal accomplishments above all else, the attainment of radical humility and self-effacement hardly seems like a goal worth pursuing. And yet, and yet. This is what John absolutely had to learn, to the point where it was his delight and greatest desire to act merely as a pointer, a sign heralding the arrival of our Savior and Lord. And that's why I've chosen this image by Leonardo. It's a very unusual picture of John. Some find Leonardo's John too beautiful too androgynous to be the real face of the Baptist. It was probably the last picture Leonardo painted before his death. It's been the subject of a very controversial restoration project by the Louvre, 
which is where this work lives. None of the images I will show you really does justice to the beauty of this work when you see it in person. And the picture of the restored image on the right is pretty horrible, but it's the best I could find. I prefer the older version, even with its darkened coats of varnish. John seems to arise mysteriously out of the darkness, rather like the messages inside those silly magic eight ball things where a reply would swim up to you out of the darkness inside the ball. Reply hazy, ask again later. Technically speaking, the image of John is a textbook display of two techniques that Leonardo mastered to a supreme degree. The use of chiaroscuro and the use of sfumato. Chiaroscuro, or literally bright dark in English, is the use of contrasting dramatic light and deep shadow to create shapes and to heighten drama in a scene. The other technique, called sfumato, literally means vanishing gradually like smoke. What it calls for is the softening of the borders between light and shade on the canvas. The transition from light to dark is so subtle as to be imperceptible, as you can see famously in the painting of Mona Lisa. Just zeroing in there on her face. And as you can see here with John, it's impossible to find a clearly demarcated line of contrast anywhere. Leonardo pioneered in the use of both of these techniques, and it was he who brought them to perfection. When Leonardo painted the image of a holy person, or even a secular portrait like the Mona Lisa, his default position was to create beauty, as you can see in these simply ravishing images of angels, the Virgin Mary, and several secular portraits and studies. They're all worth our attention. And he could make men beautiful as well. Here you see his studies for the Last Supper and the images of Jesus, Philip, John, and Andrew. Yes, he could do old age and ugliness and anger and anguish and every other condition the human face might express. But creating exquisite beauty seemed to provide him with his favorite challenge. I'd like to take a small detour here to show you images of such beauty that they almost take your breath away. This painting is called The Virgin of the Rocks. There are two versions of it, one in Paris at the Louvre and the other at the National Gallery in London. We're looking at the London version. It shows the Virgin Mary with John the Baptist on the left, his hands folded in prayer as he looks toward his cousin Jesus, who raises his tiny fist in a gesture of blessing. By them, on the right, sits an angel who has been identified as one of the archangels named Uriel. And while the picture itself is wonderful, I really just wanted to put the spotlight on the supernatural beauty of Leonardo's Virgin Mary and the angel Uriel. Leonardo could do beauty like no one else before or since. It mattered not one whit to Leonardo that John the Baptist probably looked grizzled and sunburned, roughened by the long years in the wilderness. Perhaps something like Alexander Cabanel's image of John from 1849. But what the Baptist stood for, his message, his voice, that was what mattered. And that message of the coming of Christ, the good news, had to be rendered beautifully because the message itself was beautiful. 
wondrous, unimaginably splendid. So John, the messenger, is beautiful. And this beautiful man is doing just one thing in this picture. He is pointing upwards toward the cross you can dimly make out, but beyond that, to the one who will come, the lace of whose sandal he is not worthy to tie. And it's clear that this simple act of pointing toward another brings a beautiful smile to his lips. His joy will soon be complete. As he put it in speaking of Jesus, he must increase, I must decrease. And that, curiously to us, brings him great joy. That's what the training in the wilderness was all about. Learning always to take his mind off himself and always to look out for the day he could announce the arrival of the Son of God. It's a wonderful twist on our eager, ego-centered expression, looking out for number one. John is quite literally tasked with the job of looking out for the number one of all time and heralding his coming. Perhaps this image will stay in your mind during this second week of Advent reminding us all that our job, too, is to look out for Jesus in our very midst and also to long for his coming. Until I see you next week, I hope, be blessed and be well.